Many must have heard or seen of De Glocke, the powerful top-secret time machine, a part of the Wunderwaffe collection. It was allegedly created by the Nazis towards the end of the Second World War. It is a weapon presumed to be so powerful, so out of this world, that even in the last minutes of the war, it could have changed everything. The so-called weapon was De Glocke, or the Bell, and will have been one of Hitler's secret weapons, such as the V2 or the ME262, with which the Nazi regime intended to reverse the course of the war, which, from Stalingrad, seemed inevitably lost. The first author to mention De Glocke was the Polish journalist Igor Watowski, whose research work was later developed by other authors such as Nick Cook and Joseph Farrell. However, it is unanimous among historians that there is insufficient evidence to affirm that De Glocke existed, and that's nothing more than an urban myth. Few people were aware of it since it remained secret for many years. It was an anti-gravity UFO-like saucer craft that many believed could travel across time, and this mysterious Nazi bell is known to have served several purposes, including getting the Third Reich into space. It is purportedly possible through the unexplainable UFO-like gravity-defying propulsion system with a cutting-edge technology not available to the masses. Adolf Hitler ordered this technology to be developed, but when all odds were not favoring the Third Reich, he channeled more resources to this program to accelerate its progress in a bid to radically change the course of the war. There's a great deal of evidence that suggests that the scientists, including Hermann Oberth, Werner von Braun, and others were working on it. It took Igor Watowski, a journalist known to write on military technology in the history of the Second World War, over 15 years of archive researching of different countries to publish Prada o Wunderwaffe. He discussed De Glocke succinctly in this book. De Glocke resulted from a scientific experiment conducted by German scientists working directly for the SS in a secret facility known as the Ries, otherwise known as the Giant. It is a device made of a highly resistant and heavy metal with a width of about 2.7 meters and a height of 4.5 meters. The object has the shape of a bell, hence the name De Glocke, translated to the Nazi bell. The device is believed to have two counter-rotating cylinders that would be filled with a substance similar to mercury and violet in color. This substance was called Xernum 525. Outside De Glocke, the substance is believed to have been carefully stored in a very thin, lead-protected term. Some authors say that the object at one point caused the death of 60 scientists who were later buried in a collective grave nearby. At least this is Joseph Farrell's account, since Cook claims that these scientists were executed under strict order by the SS before the approach of Soviet forces so they could cover up the existence and avoid the device or its information falling into enemy hands. When it was active, de Glocke was always in rotation, caused by the passage of a strong electrical current through the Xernum, or through a more mechanical rotation created by a turbine identical to those then equipped by German jets. After the first activation, others followed with several plants and animals in the immediate vicinity that decomposed into a black amalgam in a matter of minutes or hours after one exposure. Scientists who remotely monitored these experiments said they felt a metallic taste in their mouths after the end of each activation. This would indicate the emission of radiation of some kind, which would be consistent with the reports of sleep problems. These reports also added that the device was only activated after being surrounded by ceramic bricks and rubber layers, but that these materials had to be replaced after each activation. This probably lethal task was carried out by prisoners in the region's concentration camps. A lot of information about this mysterious device got to be known due to the interrogation of secret security officer Jacob Sporenberg. The Polish journalist in his book reveals that he discovered the existence of de Glocke after reading the transcript of the interrogation. This transcript was shown to Witowski in August 1997 by a member of the Polish Secret Service who had access to the secret government file containing the information about German secret weapons. The journalist claims that he was only allowed to copy the text, having to return it even without photographing it. In other words, the only material source that could prove the veracity of this project is elusive and if it even exists, it remains buried in a government archive. It could also be nothing more than the product of a writer's imagination, having the obvious motive of selling books. 
One of the central elements in this story seems to be the mysterious substance called Xernum 525. The descriptions point to it being an isotope of mercury and very radioactive. The mythical red mercury started to appear in the media in the 70s as a vital element for the manufacture of nuclear weapons, and that in Pravda in 1993 appeared as a superconductor. The International Atomic Energy Agency, though, issued in 2004 a statement confirming the mythical nature of red mercury therefore denying the myth that it would be an element to speed up the work of uranium enrichment centrifuges. The Polish journalist speculates that a reinforced concrete structure in the outskirts of the Wenceslas mines, known as the Hinge, may have served as a test site for de Glocke, although the official report claims that it would be just a cooling tower or part of a structure designed to send clean air to the mine or the support of an industrial water tank. However, neither the position which was away from the mine shaft nor the low altitude explains in a decent way how this structure was built in the Nazi period. Hey, if you haven't already, make sure to leave a like and hit the subscribe button to keep up to date. One of the most popular publications regarding the purpose of de Glocke claims it would be just an experiment of a flight device through the combination of two very high-speed turbines. However, another report suggests that this high-speed centrifugal rotation would serve to produce the radioactive substance, Xernum-525, a more daring theory holds that the device would be used in the properties of radioactive materials in a vortex or inertia when subjected to very high rotations. And this theory starts directly from the transcription of the testimony of Sporenberg that associates the device to the vortex compression and the separation of magnetic fields. Some argue that de Glocke would have had a concave mirror on its top where images of the past would be projected when the device was activated. Others argue that the device would be an anti-gravity generator that would later be used in fighter planes or the mythical flying saucers of Nazi Germany. But author Nick Cook describes a story told by an anonymous British scientist that de Glocke would be a generator of a torsion field, which would be linked to one of the supposed code names for the project, Kronos. According to this report, the device would be able to twist the four dimensions of space-time in its immediate surroundings and distort space and consequently, time. In other words, de Glocke would be a time machine. The Polish journalist who gave rise to this controversy speculates that the device was transported at the end of the war to a South American country sympathetic to Nazi Germany. Nick Cook believes it was captured and taken back to the United States as part of an agreement between that country and SS General Hans Kemmler. Later, the device would be released and would appear again in the history involved in the Kecksburg UFO incident. Some believe that de Glocke traveled back in time with the disappeared General Kamler, who had already established a peaceful retreat to the U.S. in exchange for various information on the secret weapons whose development he supervised. Some believe that the device was transported by U-boat to the mythical base 211 at the South Pole in Neuschwabenland. God, I hope I didn't botch that name. Some people think it was taken to one of the Nazi strongholds in the last months of the Great War, Norway, by a Ju-390 specifically kept in reserve for that mission at an aerodrome near Prague. The person in charge of the SS unit who would be responsible for this transport was none other than SS officer Jacob Spornberg, who was later captured by the British and handed over to the Polish, and then interrogated. The interrogation whose transcript gave rise to all of this controversy. Several encrypted CIA files have been made public, with virtually a plethora of accounts of special light spheres being seen in the German airspace. The first such sightings dates back to November 1945, where strange spheres of light crossed the German sky. Several pilots then reported that the spheres circled the planes, moving much faster than any aircraft, and were able to disappear from the most advanced radars in the blink of an eye. The mystery was a major concern for military leaders, as they knew nothing about these mysterious anomalies called Foo Fighters. So that's where their name came from. Of course, this also meant that they had no knowledge of their strength, their weapons, or their destructive ability. The officers were terrified to death when the light spheres followed them in various shapes, and the number of cases increased so much that they began to suspect perhaps German experiments were the result of the Foo Fighters phenomenon. At first, they thought of deploying remote-controlled machines, a kind of nimble spy plane sent to the sky as a destination for enemy images. In 1944, several northern German bases were demolished, so Hitler decided to take the most feared projects to Roklaw, Poland. The underground base there was called Daris. 
Experiments in the protection of the mountains could proceed in secret until the Allies shed light on the secret projects. One of the most interesting running experiments was called Lothar, which lasted from 1944 until the loss of the war. The best engineers worked on a weapon that could have steered the war in a more favorable direction. The Ries was home to the already mentioned secret operation, the Glocke. The complex is still open to the public today, although it's been badly damaged by natural forces. Yet there are clear traces of experiments on machines resembling flying saucers. Several researchers undertook to dig themselves into the files of Operation Glocke, not even guessing how strange the things they would encounter would be. First, there were reports written by those who worked there. They unanimously claimed that SS engineers experimented with bell-shaped, vertically flying vehicles. The goal was to create a fast, invisible machine for radars that would allow them to take off unnoticed anywhere, anytime, and even stay in foreign air so that no one would notice. That is why they started working on a new technique, anti-gravity engines. The most famous scientist whose name can be mentioned on the subject was Victor Schauberger. His name is associated with the idea that a vertically moving aircraft would be more efficient to deploy than its counterpart used until then. All the reserves of the Third Reich were devoted to the creation of these special machines. So it's no wonder that the Allies wanted to acquire the technology, even in the wake of mere rumors. We know of Operation Gap Clips that Nazi scientists were transported by US agents to the United States, where they wanted to develop their saucers to transport people, bombs, and toxic substances from one point to another based on records and scientific findings. The United States had commissioned a Canadian company to make a flying saucer based on German records. The development proved successful successful, but the structure failed miserably at the show. It was only able to rise two meters above the surface and was unable to maintain altitude. The project was no longer funded after that, but the interesting turnaround comes only after that. The real question is, was it just a hoax or deceptional theory? According to many, the Canadian demonstration was a simple disguise with which the US only wanted to obfuscate the success that Nazi scientists and research brought in aircraft development. The Americans may have managed to grab a perfectly functioning saucer, which would not be a surprise, as all indications are that the technology was already known to the Germans during World War II. This is suggested by another former Polish SS station, Sobon, in which the remaining Remaining equipment and machinery that can be seen there suggests Nazi vehicles were not just floating above the ground. There's an interesting arena-like structure at the base, which many say was a vertical runway to test the already completed UFO prototypes. Because there were super secret experiments in the valley and thousands of soldiers blocked direct access, Sobon was given the name Nazi District 51. The main basis of the theories is that the Germans certainly managed to build a jet-powered machine capable of vertical motion, as the details of the machine development were a huge secret and they were hidden from prying eyes that they only fell into foreign hands several years later. If that's the case, it's reasonable to assume that America has all the data that can be used to make the advanced aircraft there. According to this, the Canadian demonstration was a clever ruse to think of extraterrestrial intervention at every UFO sighting, rather than military spies or aircraft carrying dangerous goods. Because it is common to detect strange light phenomena in US airspace, as was the case in German airspace at the time, many think that the aircraft built from the Nazi legacy is being tested so that enemy countries can be of its surprise. If this is indeed the case, there could be no enemy to match the great power that control this secret technology. Anyway, that's it for today. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell, <laughs> see what I did there, to get more updates when we post videos. Like always, y'all, have a good one.